Bible with you, turn please to Hebrews chapter 4. The epistle to the Hebrews, the fourth chapter. It's a short chapter, so we'll read from verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest, a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, As it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen, and God will bless us that reading from his own precious word. And we'll be coming back to that uh, in a wee while. But meanwhile, we are really going to the situation that existed when Jesus was crucified around about Matthew chapter 27. And what I want to talk about this morning for a little while is contemplating Calvary. It really is summed up to some extent of the fact of the, that first line that we sang in the first hymn, I stand amazed in the presence And the sense of the presence of God is something that is absolutely necessary to each one of us. Uh, Many years ago, when we were in a church in Yorkshire, no, I was going to say York, not York, Yorkshire in Rotherham, we had a a man from California come to preach. And uh, we'd never met him before. He came and he, he ministered among us. But his introduction to himself was when most evangelists from America come to this country, he said, they rattle on and they really get things moving. He says, not so with Arne Vick. He says, it has been said that when Arne Vick preaches, you have time to admire the landscape. So we're going to admire the scenery a wee bit this morning and not be rushing into anything too much. My thoughts really begin in Matthew 11 where three times John the Baptist during his ministry challenges the people who are sitting there or people who've come to the the baptismal site. And and this is his question. What went you out for to see? That's AV style. Why are you here? Three times he asked the question. Why are you here? What did you come to see? What did you think you were going to find when you came here? You heard about things that were going on. You heard about the drama and all the rest of it. Why are you here? What made you come? And it's against that background that I want to think about Calvary this morning. We're coming around the Lord's table, and of course, central to the Lord's table is the fact that following his institution of the Lord's Supper, 
we have Calvary, we have the crucifixion. And it seems to me that there are two groups of people who are concerned with Calvary. The first see it as a sad spectacle, and the second group see it as a suffering Savior. And so those are the two areas we're going to look at briefly this morning. Uh, I'm told that the Sunday school comes back in about 25 past, so you're safe enough. Uh, we'll be done by then, and they'll get back in in good time. Think about this with me then. Uh, and really, when I get into these kind of things, I really don't want to stand up here and preach. What I want to do is I want to go with you on a journey. I want you and me to walk down a road together and to see what we can see. Uh, every once in a while, I, I'll go down uh, past the county hall. And uh, one day last week, I was going down, and there was about 20 people coming up on the, the off side of the road, walking up the way. And when I got to the bottom of the hill, there was another 20 people going the other road. And they were obviously part of some kind of a walking club. And I thought to myself, I don't know where they're going, but it'd be interesting to hear their comments about what they see. Because at this time of year, there's all sorts of things. There are different kinds of birds and flowers and blossoms coming out that we don't expect just at this point in time. And you just wonder. Sometimes as we get into our Christian life, we, we barge through. You know, we set the cruise control. We hit the accelerator. We, we just let the old vehicle run and we're not seeing very much. One of the things that happens to me occasionally is I travel in the back of Jean's car. In the back. But the interesting thing about traveling in the back of Jean's car is that I get to look out the side windows. Now, I would tend to do that when I'm driving my own car, but it's not a good habit. You're supposed to keep your eyes on the road. But if you're traveling in the back of somebody else's car and they're driving, you get a chance to look on either side and you see things that you never saw before. And this morning, I really want to draw you with me to Calvary. Funny thing, I, I was almost tempted. I hate to say this to you, it's terrible. When I was in Africa the last time, I, I was with a, a colleague that I know in, in uh, Johannesburg, and he gave me two little wire chairs, and it, they're, they're done with different colored beads on them. And he said, if you remember, that chair is for praying for Swaziland, and that chair's for praying for Botswana. And I, I almost had a notion to put a lace round about my neck this morning and hang one of these chairs on it. Because if you stop and think about it, that's what you do, especially the ladies. Not only the ladies, a lot of men are doing it nowadays, but that's what you do. You get yourself a wee gold chain and then you hang a cross around it. And the wee cross is a symbol of the electric chair in America. Think about it. It's a symbol of death. Now, it means an awful lot more to us today. But fundamentally, it's the sign of Roman crucifixion. And that's what we carry around our necks. So there's something to be said for examining where we are and what we're about. The sad spectacle then. Let's think about that for a minute. The Bible says that they sat down and they watched. I'm going to look at that a wee bit more tonight in more detail. But the question is, what did they see? What did they see? Imagine the scene. We're talking about a rough hillside. I don't think you should think of Slemish. I really don't. If you've ever been to Israel, then you know that there's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre where people say, this is traditional Calvary. Well, it might be. But if you're a Christian, an evangelical Christian, then you've been to the garden tomb. And when you're standing in the garden tomb, you see what looks like an authentic kind of a tomb. But just at the side of that, you see a cliff face. And in the cliff face, there are erosions there, which make the cliff face look like the face of a skull. And you can imagine the cross being on the top of that hill. And so we're not talking a high hill. We're talking about a hill that was close enough for people to look close enough for people to reach, close enough for somebody to come along with a bit of stick and a sponge on it and put up some vinegar when the Lord was hanging there. There was a fellow called Morris West. He, he wasn't a Christian, didn't claim to be a Christian. In fact, I think he had a Roman Catholic background, wrote a book called The Day Christ Died. 
very insightful. And one of his points was that the, the, the crosses that were used for crucifixion were not something way high up. They were actually so that the feet of the people who were being crucified wasn't more, weren't more than about three feet off the ground. Think about that. If you have a crowd standing round the cross and the feet of the crucified person is only about three feet off the ground, you're standing in the middle of them. So you're not talking remoteness. You're not talking distance. You're not talking being far away so that you can look at it. But it is a spectacle. And a spectacle, of course, is something that is something that happens fairly quickly. It doesn't last for very long. To these people, I'm sure it was a spectacle that they saw fairly regularly with the Romans there because this was the Roman form of execution. But as they looked at this man hanging on the central cross, what did they see? What did they see? If you go to your hymn book, you've got a hymn there that says, Extended on the cursed tree, besmeared with dust and sweat and blood. See there the Christ of Calvary. Sweat not nice. Dust sticking to the sweat. You've all been there. Ladies cleaning. And when you finish cleaning, you want to get out of the old clothes that are sweaty and dusty, and you want to have a shower or a bath. You want to get clean and fresh again. Not pleasant, not nice. And if that then is compounded by blood, blood that flows from his head because of the crown of thorns, Blood that flowed from his face. He gave his back to the smiters, his cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. So you're talking blood from the front. You're talking blood from the back. You're talking blood from the wrists and blood from the feet. Eventually, you're talking about blood and water from his side. Spectacle. Spectacle. You're looking at something that would make you cringe. Unless you were so remote. Unless you were so uninvolved. Unless it was nothing to do with you. Unless it was only something that you wanted to be looking at. Nothing to do with me. This is them. This is something to do with somebody else. But nothing to do with me. And therein lies one of our dangers as Christians. That we become so familiar with the Calvary scene and with the Christ who died there, that we're not affected by it anymore. There are people deep dyed in sin who become confronted by Calvary and all that it means and find themselves unable to stop weeping. And they weep for the pain, for the anguish that they see Christ bearing and for the knowledge that he did it all for them. But once you've been a Christian for a few years, that goes that's something that's part of your own history. That is something that belongs to you. This is yours now. And those aspects of it don't impinge the same way that they used to do. And so we just sit back and we say, well, okay. There was blood, there was sweat, there was dust, there was thorns, there were nails. And then there was a sign written up over his head. And it said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Interesting one, that. Somebody made a film recently, didn't they? I, I've never seen the film, but I think I read the book about Idi Amin, who called himself the last king of Scotland. I would like you to know that there has never been a king of Scotland. The kings that Scotland ever had were king of the Scots, but not king of Scotland. Robert Bruce, king of Scots. So when you come to think about Jesus... He is not limited in his rulership to the small province that we call Israel. But he is, in fact, king over all who are Jews, wherever they are, wherever in the world they may be. And don't forget, when Jesus died on the cross at Calvary, he was at the crossroads of history. And if you go back through the Old Testament, you find that the Jews were all over the world. They were in Babylon. They were in Egypt. They were scattered. They were dispersed. Not everybody came back from Babylon. 
You read through Ezra and Nehemiah, you discover that when Ezra and Nehemiah decided that they were going to go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple, get the people resettled, the people who decided that they were well satisfied with where they were, they were excused from going back to Jerusalem on condition that they paid money. You didn't just get away with it, but you had to pay money. There had to be something that went back. But they were content where they were. So when you're coming to Calvary, you're talking about Jesus, King of the Jews. And of course, many of them had said the night before, he's not my king. Don't want this man to rule over us. A lot of people saying that at the moment in America about Obama. Don't want this man ruling us. I dare say there's a few saying it here about David Cameron at the moment, and especially Mr. Clegg, you know. Don't want these boys running the thing. But then you've got few alternatives, haven't you, when you come to that kind of political situation. But here you were talking exclusivity, Jesus, King of the Jews. Don't put that up. Take that down. Don't write, don't write that. Don't write, it's not true. And Pilate, despite his anguish at being thought an enemy of Caesar, says, what I have written, I have written. I wrote it, it stays. And you can't get away from that. So while they're sitting there, while this spectacle's going on, there's this thing staring them in the face, this thing catching them in their eyes and registering on their brain, king of the Jews, king of the Jews, is he? Could he be? Is there any kind of question about it? Not really too sure about that. But they're all sitting there and they're all watching and the time is going on. Crucifixion took from about 12 until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Heat of the day, sun at its zenith. No wonder there was sweat and dust. And all these people sitting there watching, crowds of them. And suddenly, somebody turned off the sun. You ever been in that kind of situation? You have been in a situation where suddenly, in our situation, because of clouds usually, the sun vanishes, and what used to be a very bright and shiny day suddenly isn't there anymore. And the clouds are so black and thundery that you think to yourself, ooh, don't like this. Makes me feel a bit funny. Well, you imagine if somebody actually switched off light. If light as such vanished. If there was pitch blackness. And these people are sitting beside one another, maybe in families, maybe with friends, and saying, where are you? Are you still there? Where did you go? I'm, I'm here. And there's a note of panic in the conversation. What's going on? What's going on? And then there's a shaking and a rumbling and an earthquake. And the Bible says the rocks rent. Now, if we're talking about that situation near the garden tomb, then they might have been sitting down on the lower level and they might have been sitting there with rocks falling on them. You ever driven along that road from Stranraer up to Kilmarnock? And every once in a while, you see these notices that says, falling rocks. What are you going to do about them? You know, you see these boulders on the sign. What difference does it make? If it falls, it falls. You can't get out of the road. Just too bad. You've had it. But imagine sitting there in the pitch black, and suddenly there's a bang next to you, and you realize that it's part of the mountain. It's part of the hillside. It's the rocks coming apart and falling down. Is there a panic there or not? And gradually the light comes back after three hours of darkness. And somebody says, did you hear what happened while the light was out? No. The veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. No. Couldn't be. Shouldn't be. What are we going to do now? We're not allowed in there. That's where the high priest goes. And now you're saying that there's nothing to stop us from seeing right into the holy place we'll die. Yes, they would. Except 
that the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and it was done by the hand of Almighty God, who no longer wanted to keep people away from him, but wanted people to come close to him. And so if you sit through all of that, what else are you going to see? What are you going to hear? Well, just briefly, they, they would have heard seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. We're not going to go through them uh, this morning. Gasps of breath. A, a, a struggle to lift himself up a little bit so they could get a breath because the way he was crucified, his whole lungs would be compressed and, and difficult to breathe. One wee word, I, I, I am thirsty. Somebody reaches up a sponge full of vinegar. No, I don't want that. That's no good to me. Sitting down, they watched him there. When you come to the other viewpoint, that of the suffering Savior, then you hear various things. In Luke 23 and verse 34, you hear him saying things like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What? Who is he saying forgive to? Does that include me? Could I be part of that? Father, forgive them. Well, you see, when he said it, his hands were wide open. They would have included everybody who could ever have drawn near. Father, forgive them. A little later on in John 19 and verse uh, 30, you hear him cry. Now, in your Bible, your Bible records that he said, it is finished. In fact, the reality is that he shouted out one word, Tetelestiai! And really, it was an exclamation which simply said, finished, done, complete. And that's really why we read Hebrews 4. I'd love to go through the whole of Hebrews 4 with you sometime. You start in chapter 3, which talks about the Israelites coming back into the land of Canaan. You get to chapter 4, and there in uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 3, it says quite simply, the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And so if you go through all the Old Testament history and you come to that moment in time when Jesus hangs on the cross and cries out from the agony of his own soul, finished, then what you are seeing or what you're hearing recorded is that Jesus has come to that point that is identified as having been started in the very beginning of the foundation of the creation of the world and has now come to conclusion right now. And the God who created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day is now able to rest completely because the work of salvation, the work of atonement, the work of substitution is now complete. The work is done. What does it say about Jesus afterwards? It says that he went back to his father and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That was John 19, verse 13. Finished, done, complete. And you know, the wonderful thing for you and me is this, that there is nothing more to do. When we think about a suffering Savior, we think about the blood, the sweat, the tears. We think about that awful anguish that he went through. And we realize that when he said, Father, forgive them, we were included. When he cried in anguish of soul, finished. The devil was defeated instantly. The work of salvation was complete. There is absolutely nothing more to be done. And in retrospect, the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What does the Bible say about you and me? It says we are chosen in him before the foundation of of the world. It's one of the great mysteries, isn't it, that we have a God who is omniscient, a God who's omnipresent, a God who's omnipotent, a God who created all that we can see around us, 
who knew that Adam would sin but made him just the same, who before Adam even sinned had prepared a plan of salvation, a restitution, a restoration, so that you and I one day could become sons and daughters of the living God, so that the rest which God enjoyed on the sixth day and the rest which is now part of his very nature and to which you and I are invited, read Hebrews chapter 4 in its entirety, is something that becomes reality for you and me. When the angel at the birth of Jesus said, peace on earth, he wasn't talking about a general peace, he was talking about a personal peace. You and I have rest. Are you anxious about anything this morning? Is there anything troubling you? Are you worried? Are you fearful? Is there something getting to you? There's a rest for the people of God. Now, in Hebrews chapter 4, just to take it briefly, the Word makes it very clear that the people who initially heard the Word did not enter into the rest that was prepared for them because the word that they heard was not mixed with faith in their hearts. Difficult that. You imagine that God prepares everything, everything that you can ever need for body, for mind, for spirit. Everything you can ever need materially, physically, spiritually, anything, everything, God has already prepared and provided, and entering into it is a question of faith. Do I trust Him enough? Can I believe Him enough? When Jesus had fed the 5,000, what did He do next? He went to a mountain and prayed. And sometimes, you know, when we get a blessing from God, we go around shouting about it. Well, what we should be doing is going away and having a wee time of prayer and thanking the Lord. Go back into the Old Testament. You find Elijah, not Elijah, beg his pardon, Samson. Samson doing all sorts of damage to the Philistines. What happens after him? He is so weary that he goes and he lies down and loses his strength. Mistake, mistake. So as we gather at the cross called Calvary, and we catch in our own view the picture of our suffering Savior, we hear His offer, forgive them. We hear His statement of completion, finished. We see Him not being put to death, not simply dying but giving up the ghost. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He did it. Stephen did it. Doesn't happen to you and me very much, does it? Well, it would only happen the once anyway. Giving up the ghost. Yielding himself to the Father. What happened? Well, you see, there were soldiers there. And Roman soldiers had no notion of forgiveness. They had no idea of grace. And yet, the Roman centurion who was in charge of the, the execution party in Matthew 27 and 54 said, certainly this was a righteous man. Now, if he could come to that conclusion, I suppose there might have been other soldiers who heard him and agreed with him. Is it possible that out of this man and perhaps others, who were on secondment to Judea from Rome, went back to Rome and carried the gospel with them, went back and told what they had seen, regaled their friends and their family with all the executions that had taken place, all the bad people they'd put to death, and then in the midst of it all saying, ah, but there was one. And this one was different from everybody else. How was he different? What was different about him? And then they expressed to these friends of theirs all that Jesus had been, all that he could be to those who received his forgiveness. 
Well, of course, you know and I do that beside him, on either side, there were two malefactors. Great old-fashioned word, that, isn't it? Malefactors, evildoers, rogues, vagabonds, murderers. And one says, hey, you really ought to be doing something about this. You're supposed to be God. If you're God, get us all out of this. Come on. Surely a God could do something. And his friend says, we're here by right. This man has done nothing amiss. Lord. That's a good starting point for every one of us. That's a good starting point. The apostle Paul, when he was converted on the Damascus Road, started there. When he was there on the Damascus Road and he couldn't see because his eyes had been uh, blinded by the light that was above the light and the brightness of the noonday sun, his cry when he heard the voice was, Lord, who are you? What do you want me to do? Here's a man hanging on the cross ready to die. Lord! And while for us today it's a common enough word as a Christian, but in days gone by, the word Lord would have meant so much more. It would have had a, a physical connection to our everyday living because we might well have lived in a wee cottage on a wee estate and the man who was in charge of the cottage and the estate was somebody was Lord somebody this or Lord somebody that. And you and I would have known what it meant to meet him on the road and we would have called him Lord this or Lord that and we'd have bowed and we'd have touched the forelock and we said, good morning, sir. And there would have been a sense of awe in the natural, there would have been a sense of awe. And yet as Christians, we have become so blasé about our Christianity that the word Lord, we sing it. He is Lord, he is Lord, he is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Is he really? Only you and I can answer that for ourselves. I can't tell you whether he's Lord to you or whether you, uh, he's Lord to me, you can't say. The reality is he is Lord. For God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so here's a man hanging on the cross, his life about to expire. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I've got more to do than remember you. Sure, you're only an old bit of scruff. You're dying and you're, it's only right that you should die. Look at me. I'm the son of God. I'm sinless. I'm perfect. Why should I remember you? I've got more in my mind than remembering you. Not a bit of it. Today you will be with me. Today you will enter into rest. Today you will experience forgiveness. Today you will find out what it means to be related to me in a relationship that is eternal. And I believe that one of the people we will see when we go to heaven is the man we call the dying thief. Today you will be with me. Luke 23, 43, if you're keeping notes. That's where you'll find him. Today you will be with me. So let's go back into Hebrews 4 for a minute and ask ourselves the question, what is it that God intends for you and for me, people who have trusted in him, people who have believed in him? You cannot read Hebrews 4 meaningfully without you first of all read Hebrews 3 and read it straight through. Because when you read Hebrews 3, you begin, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. That's where we are. The suffering Savior is our high priest. He's the apostle. He is the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And as we consider him, that's what we're trying to do this morning. We're trying to sit down and say, what does he look like? What does his dying on the cross mean to me? What did it mean to the people sitting there? What did it mean to the Roman centurion? What did it mean to the man hanging at the side of him? What did it mean to the other fellow who didn't want to know? 
What does it mean to you and to me that every Sunday morning you can come in through a door to a centrally heated church, to comfortable seats, to sing hymns of praise, to enter into worship, and to exalt the one who is the Lord of our profession? What does that mean? Does it mean that, well, we're in the habit and this is what we do? Does it mean, well, this is how we live? Since we became Christian, this is, this is the kind of thing we do. Or does it lead you to that place that we sang about? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, who came from Nazareth, was known as the Nazarene. I, I, and I take time, like Arnie Vick, I take time just to ponder to wonder, how could he love me? I was a sinner. I was condemned. I was unclean. How could he love me? And there's no answer to that question. But the response is, I know that he does. I am sure that he does. I have proved that he does. All through life's journey, day by day, we've trusted in him. We've walked with him. We've talked with him. We've known him. You ever been in a situation where you stepped out of his will? How do you know you stepped out of his will? Well, on an instant, your peace goes. Suddenly, there's a disturbance within. It says, I shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have said that. And until you get back to that place where you hear him saying again, Father, forgive. Your peace is disturbed. Your rest is troubled. You're no longer tranquil anymore. Because the Holy Spirit is disturbing you and stirring things up and saying, not my way, not what I would have done. There's a better way to do it. And unless we have that kind of sensitivity in our lives, moment by moment and day by day, then our Christianity will be surface. Our Christianity will be all to do with externals. And the question of personal relationship will be put on the back burner. Back in 1964, before some of you were born, wasn't it? Back in 1964, we started a youth camp for the young people in Scotland. The first padre that we had for it somebody, you might even know him because he, he served here in the church in Armagh for a while, was a chap called Malcolm Smith. Remember him? And I will never forget Malcolm's introduction to that camp. He stood up in front of about, I don't know, 30 young people. We were only getting started. We grew a bit from then, but it was about 30 at the start. And he said this, if you have a second-hand Christianity, I'm sorry for you. And then he went on to explain. He said, some of you are here, young people, teenagers mostly. Some of you are here and you think you're a Christian because your mother and father's a Christian. You think you're a Christian because you've been taken to church all your life. You think you're a Christian because you've grown up in a Christian country. And he went on to explain what being a Christian really meant. And I feel sometimes that we allow ourselves to slide slowly into that realm of, well, you know, this is the way I am. This is the kind of things I do. Nothing disturbs me. It's all very quiet. I go to church on Sunday, and then that's me. I'm happy. There is so much more. And I ask you the question and leave it with this question. Is Calvary 
simply a spectacle? Or is Calvary for you personally an association with the suffering Savior? Because if he's only a spectacle, he will vanish, he will disappear, the background to it will grow dim. But if he's your Savior, and a suffering Savior at that, then you have entered into a relationship which needs to grow deeper and deeper and deeper the longer you go on the Christian pathway. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. I am secure. What is it? One of the Wesley said in one of his hymns, more happy but not more secure, the glorified spirits in heaven. My security, my rest, my peace is in him. And may God bless his word to our hearts this morning.